Hey everyone, Ross Marchand here, Director of Policy for the Taxpayers Protection Alliance. And just to make your quarantine, your social isolation day a little bit more interesting, we have Dan Savakas here with FreedomWorks to talk all about regulatory policy as it relates to containing the coronavirus pandemic. Dan, how are you today? I'm doing all right. How are you, Ross? Doing good. Hanging in there. Thinking a lot yeah. about regulatory policy um, and social distancing. Oh, and by the way, the last time I saw you, um, I think it's been around six or seven weeks, right, since, uh, since CPAC. And yeah. just to let the audience know, we did maintain social distance, right, six feet apart. Um, and we namasteed instead of uh, shaking hands. Is that correct? Uh, that's, that about sums it up. Okay. All right, just trying to clear the record, making sure that we're not unwittingly uh, spreading coronavirus. <laughs> um, but just to um, just to dwell on the point of containing the coronavirus, um, what sort of regulatory policies do we have in place right now that are hampering us responding effectively in a timely manner um, to this pandemic? And, and what sort of policies can we roll back? Um, to make sure that people are staying safe from this deadly disease. Yeah, absolutely. I wrote a blog post on the FreedomWorks website, uh, freedomworks.org, a couple weeks ago, talking about how regulatory policy and uh, government regulations have actually stemmed our ability to respond effectively to this crisis. And I uh, know Reason Magazine has also done a lot of great work talking about this. And I basically went through the story of a doctor in the Seattle area, Dr. Helen Chu, who actually identified that coronavirus was gonna be a problem in January, and she tried to conduct testing, but the CDC told her her tests were not approved, that she had to change the way she was doing her testing, and they wouldn't recognize her tests. So she had to go through all of that to get her test approved by the CDC, but they mm -hmm. still told her that she couldn't conduct these tests because the FDA had not approved her as an approved tester because she didn't have a clinically approved testing facility. So Dr. Chu has to wonder, how do I get approved as a clinically approved testing facility? And the FDA laid out all of these guidelines and she brought it back to FDA and they told her, well, you have to actually go now above to HHS and they will determine whether you meet these guidelines that we have set forth. So this one doctor in the Seattle area had to go through at least three levels of bureaucracy to be able to conduct tests, to be able to get an approved facility, and then to have a separate entity determine whether or not it was actually an approved facility. And by that time, months had passed. The tests that the CDC had approved were found to have been faulty. And you saw coronavirus explode in, in the Seattle area. It was one of the first places in the U.S. where it kind of got out of control. And we were, even, even right now, we're way behind on testing. And all we had to do was loosen up our regulatory requirements at CDC, FDA, HHS. And we could have had a, a bit of a head start on this virus. And we could have gotten hit in the ground running with testing once all of this kind of hit the fan. But uh, the bureaucracy said no. And it brings to mind an interesting question. Why is there so much regulation and bureaucracy? I mean, I could, I could finish that question in so many different ways. But in this narrow case, why is there so much regulation and bureaucracy um, over scientists at labs developing tests, right, that, that could help patients out, that could identify deadly diseases? Why are there so many levels of bureaucracy to begin with? It's, it's a question that I've been asking for a while, and I know if you look at anything that a lot of old economists like Milton Friedman back in the day, he used to rail against the FDA and actually said that the FDA should go by the wayside because they probably harm more people by refusing to approve new treatments than they save by refusing to approve bad treatments. I think that's the calculus there, and I think there are a lot of entrenched players in this space and special interests involved, where only the, the very well-off entrenched players can actually afford to comply with all the regulations involved. And it also makes sure that you have to come crawling to the government if you want to get involved in, in, and it's not even just the pharmaceutical space, it's all across our economy, that you have to come crawling to the government 
to get approval for just about anything that you have to do. And you have to comply with thousands of pages of regulatory framework. And we're seeing now when we're in crunch time with a pandemic on our hands, mm-hmm. having to come crawling to the government is actually going to kill people. Right. And especially the case in just granting at a very basic level permission for healthcare workers to do what they do best and treat patients right away. Um, what sort of regulations are in place that are preventing healthcare workers um, from treating patients right away? And what more could be done um, to help more doctors and nurses join the fight? Yeah, there are some regulations on telehealth and telemedicine right now. Obviously, we don't want doctors to have to be inundated by patients, especially when you're talking about something as contagious as coronavirus is. Mm -hmm. If patients don't have to be seen by a doctor in person, we should free up hospital resources to actually tackle the pandemic and let doctors treat patients remotely for other, I guess, less immediate concerns. But because of regulations on telehealth and telemedicine, and I know this applies for uh, psychiatry as well. And I think that's something that we're going to see become important because mm-hmm. I think if you were a mental health expert and you were going to write a guidebook on how to get depression, uh, some of the guidelines will look very similar to what the CDC is recommending you do to maintain social distance. So I think mm-hmm. mental health is something that we're going to see become important soon. And there are a lot of rules and regulations surrounding, well, doctors and psychiatrists can't treat patients that they haven't actually seen Although I don't know what the functional difference would be, at least from a psychiatric perspective, between having a conversation on a couch in person and what we're doing right now, I don't know why it would be so difficult to have conversations over Zoom or FaceTime or Skype or whatever it might be, and you describe your symptoms or describe what you're feeling and actually free up resources so hospital beds aren't overflowing and we're risking other patient safety by continuing to increase the spread of the virus in crowded hospitals. Sure, and even if policymakers see the light, which, is that too much to hope for? What do do you think? (laughs) Is that too much to ask for, for them to see the light and roll back some of these rules? Uh, I think they've been doing an okay job so far. Uh, They have rolled back some minor restrictions, but Mm -hmm. it looks like they're going the wrong way especially if you look at the coronavirus phase three package with all the trillions of dollars put in there. And there was very little in the way of regulatory relief. Uh, If you just look at the arc of history, it doesn't really go in the direction of less government involvement in the economy. And sadly, there are only a few people making that argument right now. I know Thomas Massey, obviously out there making that argument. Uh, Representative Mm -hmm. Andy Biggs has a bill uh, for regulatory relief, making some of the Uh, rollbacks of regulations permanent, uh, as does Representative Chip Roy from Texas. So I think there are people making that argument, although I know a lot of people are attached to regulations and they think they're very important. So they're going to be very hesitant to roll back too much, uh, hopefully in the phase four or phase 3.1 package or whatever they're calling, whatever the next thing is going to be. Hopefully regulatory reform is going to be a bigger focus for the administration and for Congress. Right, and I'm gonna say, or I was gonna say half the battle, but it's more like a quarter of the battle or something like that, is devoted to rolling back the regulations. And then the vast majority of it is keeping the regulations rolled back after this is over. Um, Because so many people are enriched by these regulations that it doesn't make sense in terms of special interests and all that jazz um, that it's gonna stay rolled back. Um, so where can we continue to monitor uh, these developments and, and read up more about this? Uh, where can we find your work? Sure. So you can find my work, uh, like I said at the top, freedomworks.org. If you want to find our regulatory-specific work, you can go to the Regulatory Action Center, which is the program within the FreedomWorks Foundation that I run. Uh, the Regulatory Action Center's website is regulatoryaction.org. And you can check out all of our regulatory-specific stuff. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at FreedomWorks or me on Twitter at Daniel Savickas. It's just Daniel and my name, my last name, S-A-V-I-C-K-A-S. Uh, we put out a lot of good content on Twitter. And just, just keep up with what's going on in Congress. There are a lot of other resources on Twitter that will keep you updated. Uh, I, just, I just caution you to 
or not caution you, I'd exhort you to be more involved in what's going on and just be aware because especially now they can throw in a lot of stuff. And I know Nancy Pelosi tried that. So just make sure you're aware of what's going on and what they're trying to put into these packages and then tell them to try and take some stuff out of the federal register, as opposed to just dumping money into our economy. How about you let the economy breathe a little bit? Well, I'm cautiously optimistic that's going to happen. Um, but I think it, it takes a sustained effort to keep people in the know and keep pressing for these needed changes. Um, and please, please, please visit our website at protectingtaxpayers.org um, to learn so much more about what's going on and what steps policymakers are or are not taking um, to keep patients safe from these needless rules. Well, thank you so much, Dan, um, and stay safe. Yeah, hope to see you in person sometime soon. Sometime soon. Who yes. Knows, but <laughs> again, cautiously optimistic. Yeah. All right. Take care. All right. Thanks, Ross.